What's going on guys? It's the Big Rig Bull Texas Truck Accident Lawyer Richard Alexander here today in the office on a Monday fun day. Monday. Mondays are always a good time to get started on a new topic. So today we're going to get started on a deep dive into hazardous materials uh, shipping and transportation. I know I covered it before but I think I like to go a bit deeper into shipping information and on the road issues, loading and unloading of hazardous materials. So we're gonna to try to cover all that stuff in the next few weeks, all right? How does that sound? I love talking about trucks, you know, I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's an awesome area. And uh, I love the fact that it is something that is necessary um, for America to thrive. Um, I think there has to be more done by these politicians out here other than lip service to uh, establish a much more well-rounded infrastructure for goods and transportation um, of people, you know, because, I mean, you know, the ability to be able to move freely through our country is really what can alleviate, to a large extent, poverty um, or lessen it in certain aspects, simply because of the fact that if you come from a place that has a very um, weak infrastructure, it's going to be very hard for you to get out of there. I mean, it's going to be very hard for you to make a move to a place that is much more um, profitable or um, easier time to manage for you to move up in this world. I notice, you know, and I'm pretty sure most people who have lived in the South or people who have traveled the U.S., have noticed that there are certain places, um, you know, in the U.S. where the lack of transportation is, I think, a lot of times what holds people back um, from really truly progressing in their lives, especially in the South, um, the Southeast. Uh, the way that things are structured, we just don't have the built-in infrastructure the same as if you go to a northern city, you know, where you can ride the L, you can ride the subway. Most people commute through public transportation to get where they're going and back. Whereas if you live in the South, you have to have a car. You have to have some means um, where you have to, the onus is placed on you to get yourself around. Uh, and I'm not going to say it's unfair, you know, but certainly it can be a bit burdensome um, to be in that type of situation uh, where you are um, attempting to make something of yourself and you need to find a job or you need to take your child to the doctor and you get on the bus and the bus takes an hour um, to get you where you need to go um, and then an hour back and and a lot of times that is well at least when I was growing up that is being uh, hopeful on the on the light side of things because a lot of times um, you know it would take someone two hours or hour and a half uh, to get somewhere so if they were going to do a job interview um, and, you know if you have a car in the south um, you know you can hit up three four interviews in a day you know if you are dry, if you're riding the bus you know you may only be able to go to one interview so um, I think all of that fits together with trucking and the fact that you know we have to do more to make things manageable for uh, for transportation because it is so vital, it is so important um, just to, you know, the welfare of our nation. And if we don't start doing something, you know, we, I don't know how we are going to be, you know, the superpower um, of the future when you look at all the people that we have to compete against and the fact that they're willing to spend, you know, really big amounts of money to build transportation. It's, it's, it's just so important. I mean, I, I, I get the fact that people complain and they argue about other things, um, you know, services and whatnot. I don't really care about all that. But when it comes to transportation, I mean, transportation is, it, it is just simply absolutely essential to, you know, give everyone the ability to make the best of themselves. That's really what it's about because we live in a country where you know, you want to believe that everyone has the ability to pull themselves up from, by their bootstraps, and to some degree that may be true, um, but definitely, you know, uh, some bootstraps are harder to tie than others. 
um, or some are hard to pull together than others. So, you know, I just, I just think that uh, transportation is one way that we can help everyone. Sorry about the uh, ramble. Now back to your uh, board session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, you're talking to the Big Rig Bull, Texas Truck Accident Lawyer, Rashard Alexander, obviously. But today, we are going a little bit more in depth uh, regarding hazardous materials compliance. Um, I went back over that vlog I did uh, a while ago, and I just felt that it wasn't um, as deep um, as I wanted to really go into the subject. And so today, and probably for the next two weeks approximately, I'm going to just deep dive into hazardous materials um, regulations, definitions, compliance, all of it. Uh, very interesting topic, very timely topic, uh, given the, uh, the truck wrecks that we have experienced uh, recently in Houston and in the great state of Texas. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the subject. So hazardous uh, materials uh, regulation or uh, yeah, hazardous materials regulation history is basically uh, starting with or starts with the Transportation Safety Act of 1974. Um, as we progress uh, in this nation and we start to take environmental regulations um, much more seriously um, as there are more environmental catastrophes that take place in our nation. Um, we uh, consolidate the HMRs in 1976, and then uh, we eventually uh, move to the point of creating the Hazardous Materials Transportation Uniform Safety Act of 1990. Following this uh, act, there are a series of amendments that take place, but this is generally what uh, regulates um, trucking uh, for hazmat truckers across the nation. Um, Motor carriers are subject to both the hazardous materials regulations and the motor carrier safety regulations. These can be found in 49 CFR parts 100 through 107, 109, 110, 130, 171 through 180, and 390 through 397, which we should all be familiar with at this point. Um, when we're talking about hazardous materials regulations, as far as the penalties, uh, I've written the penalties out here. Uh, vi uh, violating a regulation can equal a penalty of not more than $78,376 for each violation. Violations resulting in death, serious injury, or injury, or substantial destruction of property, um, the maximum penalty is $1,800, uh, I'm sorry, $182,877. Now that's not including the lawsuit that a uh, motor carrier is going to face. This is just the regulations and the fines dealing with uh, the governing agency federally. Um, there's no minimum penalty except if the violation is related to training, then the, minim then the minimum penalty is $471. Um, continuing violations, uh, something that happens you know, daily, uh, over a period of time are considered separate violations and you are basically fined per day, per day. Um, moving right along, we're talking again about passenger carrying vehicles, but in this context we are talking about uh, hazmat materials being present on passenger carrying uh, vehicles. Now generally speaking, no hazardous materials should be transported by four higher passenger vehicles if possible. I think at this point in time, we all know what four higher uh, passenger vehicles are. Um, Division 6.1, which, uh, which is poisonous, poisonous uh, uh, hazmat uh, materials, or Division 2.3, which is poisonous gas, liquids, um, or any, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this word right, but it's paratrinaline, uh, I don't know, I'm not a science guy, may not be hauled in passenger vehicles. So, whatever this word is right here, I think it's paranitronellin. 
may be hauled in passenger, may not be hauled in passenger vehicles. Those cannot be hauled in passenger vehicles. However, there are certain quantities of some types of hazardous materials that may be hauled in passenger vehicles. And generally speaking, any hazardous material with the exception of small arms and ammunition uh, hauled on a passenger carrying vehicle must be hauled outside of the passenger compartment. This is common sense, it makes sense. Um, the exceptions for what may be hauled are up to 99 pounds gross weight of class one explosives that are permitted to be transported by a passenger carrying aircraft or rail car. Uh, not more than 100 detonators uh, division 1.4 explosives per vehicle, not more than two lab samples of class one explosives per vehicle, not more than 496 pounds of other types of hazardous materials with no more than 99 pounds of any class. A cylinder not exceeding 250 pounds that is secured against movement, not more than 99 pounds of any non-liquid division 6.1 poisonous materials, uh, class seven radioactive materials requiring labels, um, emergency shipments of drugs, chemicals, and hosp hospital supplies, and Department of Defense materials under special circumstances. So like I said, this wraps up uh, part one, or the beginning of our in-depth look at hazardous materials compliance. Um, I hope you have a blessed day, and I will see you again tomorrow. This is the Big Rig Bull, and I'm out of here.